Hello, hello, everybody. It is 9.42 a.m. Central Time on the 20th of October, 2020. It's Tuesday here in the United States. Hope you're doing well. We are here to talk about seismic events. And if you're not aware of what happened last night, we had ourselves a major earthquake up here in Alaska. Let me turn on a display capture and just get you up to speed on what happened since yesterday. We had a bunch of deep earthquakes starting 48 hours ago, 72 hours ago, hammering off down below the plates. They're the earthquakes that are raised high off the globe here, marked in a pinkish color. And then yesterday, a series of other new deep earthquakes struck. They're in a light pink color going over towards Indonesia, again raised high off the globe. That's where we were yesterday. And then last night, this very large earthquake struck on the plate boundary up here, right on the peninsula tip of Alaska, going up to 7.5. Additional fours and fives aftershocks now being reported, which was really weird they weren't reporting those at first. But let me just take you over and show you the buoys because the buoys went into event mode across the whole plate boundary from the central Aleutians all the way over right next to Haida Gwaii and the Hecate Strait over on the plate boundary by Canada. Additionally, a buoy, one, went into event mode here on the west side of the big island of Hawaii. And I'm zooming in on this spot right here just to make a point. I got contacted by somebody who tried to tell me that there was no volcanic location out here in the ocean. That's an old landslide. And I actually, well, I'd just like to show you the spot that went into motion. I'll let you guys decide for yourself. It's not labeled as a volcanic field, but these cones... These thousands of undersea cones, spatter cones, this is not a landslide, these are all cones. So I would think that the cones are, well, spatter cones, if you will, or undersea mounts that pile up on top of each other. And until otherwise proved, that's what we think it is. That's where the buoy's in event mode out in Hawaii. So just recapping, there's a line of buoys in event mode going all the way across the North Pacific from the central Aleutians over to Canada down to Hawaii. And a tsunami went out from the central location here where the big earthquake struck. An actual tsunami with a few foot high wave went into land here right next to the earthquake epicenter at Sand Point. So big outbreak taking place. Let's open up the plate boundary here and just go look at the USGS map. Show you where it happened overall. Here's our thick red line that makes up the plate boundary here across the Aleutians. And then like I said, it goes right down over into Canada. And that's where the other buoy went into event mode. So this whole region went and shifted with the earthquake yesterday. Now that goes right down to the Hecate Strait. That goes into the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. And we don't have any other earthquake activity listed here. There was a 4.0 earthquake that struck right in the middle in between these two islands, between the Hecate Strait and Vancouver Island. And the USGS just straight up ignored the earthquake. It was a 4.0 range. They just didn't report it. And the Canadians did, and so did the Europeans, and we reported it, of course. And that's the halfway point between our big earthquake and the movement that's going on down in the United States. Now, before we get into the United States, just really quick, let me bring everybody up to speed. A new 5.3 also struck over here on the Izu Ridge north of Guam, as well as 5.0 range activity that broke out here across Indonesia. Subsequent fours broke out between the fives, but it's all fives going across to Indonesia and going up towards Japan. And then on the western side, we have fours going over across Philippines up to Taiwan. And let me show it to you on the USGS plate boundary map really quick. You'll understand. So we've got fives going across over towards China. And we have fives going up towards Japan following the plate boundaries. And then the fours are going on the inside edge of here, but they're all heading up to the north and over to the west. That's the path that the earthquakes take. Now once we get over to Sumatra, Indonesia, it gets quiet. And pretty much all of China, we have to go to the western tip of China at the Taklamakan Desert for a 4.4 earthquake. I would look at the halfway point between these sets of quakes, between these in Asia and these in Sumatra, and we have to go around the bend of the plate to find that halfway point. We don't just draw a straight line across India, for instance, and look at the plate boundary there. So that's what we're going to watch. We're going to watch Myanmar going into China. Again, we're sandwiched between fives and fours, so something bigger than either should strike there. 
Now going out over towards Europe, check it out. Poland. Poland was hit. 3.5 though. I was looking for up to 4.5 to 4.9. So it's a magnitude to a magnitude and a half under what I was looking for. But it is spot on in the location. Southwest Poland right on the arrow and it follows the fours that were down to the south. We're still watching for Cyprus to get hit and a new earthquake did strike next to Cyprus but Cyprus is the tiny island right here and we're looking for something in the five-ish range maybe even bigger mid-range five to come rolling in but when I'm a magnitude and a half under that's technically an earthquake forecast miss even though it's spot on in the location I would think something bigger would be coming in but now it's going to be at the halfway point the halfway point between the 3.5 and the fours and near five that we're expecting down here to the south and that puts us back to Bulgaria Romania as the halfway point now so while Poland's been hit that now divides the area in half and we watch down to the south in between our cluster coming out of Greece and our little earthquake up here up in Poland check it out also 3.5 striking at our letter X X marks the spot Azores and Iceland mid-range five you can check now Iceland off the list we warned Iceland for this we told you the same sized earthquake that struck down in South Europe this past week which was let's see how big was it five point something five point three well they mistook it for an eruption at Grimm's Voten volcano and there were these seismic signatures that showed up out here and my viewers even contacting me about it because they made a news blurb on it that Grimm's Voten was showing signs of seismic activity and it could erupt and I said ah they do this all the time whenever there's a five or greater down here in South Europe we watch for a seismic transfer to take place across Europe and go out towards our X's to the north and I said it in the past they mistake it for a volcanic eruption they've done it with Barda Bunga they've done it with Grimm's Voten what's the other one I've uh rakes you fall or I can't pronounce the names on those volcanoes but I've done it like three or four times where they say that they think there's going to be eruption at one of the volcanoes and really it's just a push coming out from South Europe going out towards Iceland well here it is again this time it's a 5.3 to 5.5 so we started with a 5.3 going into South Europe we come out with a 5.3 to 5.5 out at Iceland out at the X now let's go over to the United States Central America and South America remember what I just said about 5.5 and 5.3 right so it goes all the way out towards Iceland this way with a 5.5 and 5.3 we get back down here and we have fives coming across out of Indonesia we have a 5.3 here on the Izu Ridge we have a 5.1 to 5.2 here on the Fiji well actually hold on that's at Tonga and then a 5.5 over here across the plate over right at the border with Peru and Ecuador that's from a day ago and then a spread of fours going down across Chile right to our travels underneath point where energy did travel underneath over the past two days mid-range fours going out across or I'm sorry upper fours 4.9 4.9 striking on both sides of the fracture zone one on the X from a few days ago one at the tip of the arrow both on the fracture zones going out across south of South America let me show it to you this way so going down around over and across following the fracture zones to the south do you see that and we have a new earthquake reported right out here let's see when did that strike hold on this just struck in the past hour is that correct yeah a new 4.9 look at that hold on again this struck at 1401 UTC and now it's 1451 so 50 minutes five zero minutes ago a 4.9 again let's just call it a five because that's what's right next to it I mean which do you think do you think it's all 4.9s everywhere or do you think they're just taking the five down to 4.9s come on it's so obvious they're taking the five down to 4.9 5.1 5.2 5.3 5.4 5.5 take them all down to 4.9 we can't have that many fives on the feed for this week that'll look like an increase you know what I mean and it is an increase but we can't have that on the feed you know what I'm saying so let's take it down to 4.9 and that's what's going on there so South America has a spread of the same sized earthquakes one side to the north 5.5 just like the 5.5 and 5.3 is going around the rest of the planet and then the fours go down around and spread across and I'll just tell you all these fours equal a five take all these fours add them together equals a five and what struck down here 4.9 fives 
Okay, continental U.S. Well, the seven up here on the plate boundary going into Alaska. That's where the red line is here on the north side. And it goes up and makes a bend and goes down to the east by southeast. You got to remember, the buoys are doing the same thing. The buoys went into event mode. And on one side, we got like 15 meters of movement. This is the craziest thing. It shows an event mode going down with all activity. It's the weirdest thing. I don't know what to make of this, guys. Now, this is a regular interval going up. And I, that, to me, looks tidal. So, you know, intermittent almost looks like, the, of course, the ocean. Of course, we would expect that. But this, I just... Going from 55.90 down to 55.75 and then springing back up. And this is going over the course of like a couple hour, an hour. And that's a 15 meter drop. Right? 45 foot drop. And then the second drop is even bigger. So 15 meters is nothing to scoff at. And I mean, we cannot ignore that. That's a 15 meter variation. But then going across over to the east, we have a bunch of other stations. And they're also in event mode going over towards the Hecate Strait. And this is the Hecate Strait in Haida Gwaii. And there is the buoy in motion from yesterday's earthquake. But it's just the smallest little event mode. It's just a little shift. Itty bitty blip. The little red blip on the chart there, which we can zoom in on it closer and see the event mode. But just slightly rising with the tide. But what does this say to me? This says to me that the whole plate boundary shifted from the central Aleutians with 45 feet of displacement, 15 meters, over on the western side, and over on the eastern side, just a little trickle out, a little bit of vibration going all the way over, down and around to the Hecate Strait. So buoy in event mode here out off the coast of the Hecate Strait, look what we're right next to. This is the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. And we know for certain 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt that the plate is now slow slipping, according to professionals. Up in the Pacific Northwest, Vancouver Island, Washington, and Oregon. Slow slipping is a term used by professionals to describe when the plate is moving a little bit faster than normal. We should call it a fast slip, but they call it a slow slip as the plate is slowly slipping. Let me show you the tremors as of yesterday reported by the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. Here we are. All these little red dots. So there's 219 on the screen for yesterday. Now this has been going up and down by several hundred. I think we topped out at 800 per day at the height of this slow slip that's been going on now for the last two weeks. Let me take you back a day and show you. Here's the 18th, two days ago. Notice anything? We're up in Washington and a cluster up at Vancouver Island. Every little red dot is a vibration as the plate shifts. It has magnitude assigned to it, but it's not really faulting. We're not really looking at fault breaking. We're seeing the plate shimmy and vibrate as one plate is moving past the other. And if you don't know which plate is moving past which plate, let me just turn on our plate boundary map again here. We have the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. We have the North American plate, Laurentia. And then on the western side, of course, the jagged edges of this belong to the Pacific plate. And the edges of the Pacific Plate are experiencing earthquakes go around the outside edge of the Ring of Fire, if you want to call it that. And it leads over to the United States and comes in from the northwest, from Alaska, down into the northwest. And then energy spreads across the North American Craton. And just remember the interior portion of this Craton graphic, this brownish rusty color. You have to remember that because the earthquakes flow along it. Now looking in the northwest... We have a line of earthquakes that's come in over the past couple days, going down towards Yellowstone, going down towards California, going even further all the way down to Southern California, across the plate. And I really need to turn on our last day's worth of earthquakes now. This is the 0, 0.0 and greater feed for the last 24 hours. While that's loading, let me just quickly address the earthquake up here in Alaska. People contacting me about it possibly being a larger earthquake. And... While I won't dispute that it could be somewhat larger, let's just say that the earthquake was, you know, 7.8 instead of 7.5, for instance. But there's some talk online about the earthquake being a 9.0 earthquake, and it's showing up on the Global Seismic Network, or the Global Array from the ANSS, the backbone, 
and it does show pretty big across those charts it's not a nine it can't be for a few reasons one we've seen nines before and nines produce major tsunami waves all the way across the Pacific let me use the Japan mega quake in 2011 as an example so the 9 8.9 to 9.0 earthquake struck USGS took it to 8.9 it was really a nine struck right here on the coast of Japan and that produced a Pacific wide tsunami that sent tsunami waves all the way over to the west coast of the United States we had a couple fatalities from that tsunami wave that came in in 2011 on the west coast of the United States fatalities so now again this earthquake struck last night and it sent out localized tsunami waves 300 kilometers or so around the area here additionally we can look at other stations compared to 2011 when the major 9.0 earthquake struck it blacked out the charts blacked it out it didn't just spread like this upper seven did yesterday it literally blacked out the charts just solid black and people are like what is this we can't even see the lines on the charts and it was just solid black because that's what a nine shows up as so just go back and compare to other nines in the past and again there haven't been many there's only been two you could even say that the Indonesia earthquake in 2004 wasn't really a nine but the nine in Japan was so uh again it was an upper seven and it produced the tsunami wave that we would expect from an upper seven and unless there's some other factors like what if there was a huge wave that we didn't see hear about yesterday some massive wave shows up I mean it could be it could very well be but again I, I we don't have any evidence of that only as evidence of a small wave showing up locally there and uh, that again kind of all points towards it okay so let's look at the rest of the planet really quick this is 24 hours worth of earthquakes reported from the USGS and EMSC and it's way low in the West Pacific as a matter of fact I'm really wondering what the heck is going on with this let me hit apply again because I just have to verify that this is our 0.0, .0 and greater earthquake feed boy I I, I mean it, it's very odd okay so in the West Pacific for 24 hours we have one two three four five six seven eight nine earthquakes I can count on but again I can just count <laughs> normally it would be a cluster across the entire region this is almost like somebody hit the off switch for reporting of earthquakes internationally as this thing's going on up here in a in Alaska but it could be that it just went quiet now if it goes seismically quiet across a huge region that's normally seismically prone that's not good we don't want to see silence across the whole planet that again now a, a lay person who doesn't look at this normally would be like oh it's great no earthquakes no 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 we want to constantly see a release taking place and a spread happening from the areas that where that builds the energy builds and transfers out from we get all our deep earthquakes hammering in on the underside of the plate over here and if it doesn't escape out and go somewhere we can see that build into an extremely large event and we don't want to see that so at this point right now it's extremely quiet in the West Pacific all the way from Fiji down to New Zealand all the way from Fiji over to Indonesia all the way from Indonesia across Philippines there's only a handful of threes and we get into Japan nothing we get up here to Kamchatka nothing we get all the way over here to the Aleutians and then we pick up with our seven so it's quiet from the Aleutians to Kamchatka Russia back down to Japan back down to Taiwan and quiet back across the Solomon Sea and Papua New Guinea of all places these are not places that we would normally consider to be quiet now I would also like to point out really quick when we see it go quiet in the West Pacific we have to look to the East Pacific we have to look to see what's happening why is this going quiet in the West Pacific well looks to me like Mother Nature has gotten to a point where it's stuck right here between the coast of the United States and back up to Alaska that's the bend that I just showed you with all the buoys so with this low number of earthquakes internationally it's really raising my eyebrows here in the United States that's why I'm taking the time to show you this low international number of earthquakes because getting into the US let's dive into the Northwest no earthquakes reported across Washington except for one in the 
Strait of Juan de Fuca. That's technically on the Canada side of the border, too. Look at that. They have it listed. Oh, no, am I wrong? I'm wrong on that. Hold on. It's not on the Canada side of the border. It is like 10 miles on the U.S. side of the border. It's the San Juan Islands National Monument. Never even heard of the place. 0 0.9 at Orcas, Washington. But I'll just call that at the U.S.-Canada border. So nothing. Meanwhile, all of Washington, Vancouver Island, going down into Oregon, all shifting with those little red dots on the tremor map. Again, this is yesterday's tremors. Or here's yesterday's tremors, the 19th. Look what happened. It shifted down to southwest Oregon. The day before, we were up in Vancouver, right? Look. The 18th, we're in Washington with a cluster in Vancouver. Vancouver Island. And then the next day, yesterday, we shift completely to the south. Now that matches perfectly with the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. Look up here to the north. We were shifting up here at Vancouver Island, where this arrow points right into the spot where we were shifting. The arrow of the break in the plate on the Juan de Fuca, that is, pointing in. Now down to the south, the southern arrow pointing into the spot where we're shifting in southwest Oregon. So it shifted from up here to down here. That, to me, says these pinnacle tips where the stress or tension is coming from, those are pointing into the spots that are shifting on land up above. So this is coming in from down below and going in and coming in up above on the edge of the plate on land, shifting, vibrating, Washington and Oregon. And that really matters when we take that into consideration with the plate boundary shifting in the seven up to the north. So last night was the technical expiration of my warning for California. We had been seven days and now we're on day eight. So what happened? Well, we saw a spread of threes in this dead of a spread of upper fours. And every location that got hit, bar one, just one location missed. But this is way, way under what I expect. I was looking for upper four to low five and instead we get mid-range to low end three. But let's just name the location so you can see which got hit. A 3.9 to 4.0 earthquake struck last night, or yesterday. This is right next to Eureka. Eureka's right here to the north. And we're down to Geysers. We also had a little outbreak over here right at Monte Cristo Hills, between Monte Cristo Hills and Long Valley Caldera. And we had an outbreak down here next to San Diego 3.4. You could also count in the 3.1 out here on the east of the San Andreas next to Pisgah Crater. So the one spot that did not move is the center. Well, actually, there's two spots, I should say. Two spots in the one spot. Bay Area and Owens Valley did not move. The rest, all the way around it, moved. You can see it. Even Idaho, up here at the Yellowstone Magma Chamber, but it's all in the three range. So, or well, I mean, come on, a 3.9, what do you want to call that? A, a single four, right in, like, the coast area, coastal area, 4.0, 3.9. That's way under. If I'm looking for 4.9 and the highest comes in at 3.9, we are missing a full magnitude's worth of energy caught between the area shifting, which is the Juan de Fuca, Washington and Oregon, and California. It's caught up in there. And look where it's quiet. Look where there are no reported earthquakes, but we have hundreds of tremors and shifting. So how can that be? No earthquakes, but it's shifting and moving. Well, all around it are where the earthquakes are taking place. And I'm not exaggerating, it really does go all the way around it, fracturing taking place in the plate. So this spot's vibrating and shifting, Washington, Oregon, and then next to it, over at Yellowstone, above the magma chamber for Yellowstone, right there in Idaho. And in case you don't know, the magma chamber for Yellowstone starts at the surface in Wyoming, here at the border, right at the park, and then goes down below all of Idaho. And the feeder for the magma chamber comes from below Oregon. It's 11 Grand Canyons in size, the magma chamber. So this earthquake swarm that's breaking out in Idaho is above the center of the deepest part of the magma chamber for Yellowstone. I have to tell this to everybody all the time because they do not know about the magma chamber going all the way over to Oregon. They think it's just at the park. They think, oh, Yellowstone right here at the park must be down below here. Well, it is, and it goes down at an angle all the way below the other two states to the west. Now, there's a line of earthquakes going across the Craton Edge in Montana down into the park as well. The Craton Edge, remember I told you to remember that? Remember I told you to remember it. Let me get a sip of my coffee. A little redundancy there. 
So, a little slurpage on that coffee. Sorry, guys. So we're looking for the release. It has not taken place fully yet. All the spots are starting to move, but the magnitudes are under, just like what I was talking about over in Europe with Poland. Poland, a full magnitude under as well. I'm getting the locations just spot on, man. But down to the magnitudes, we're missing power. So we have to look for more release to take place. When we're missing a whole magnitude, that means another magnitude's worth of energy can be piled on and added in. Now the plate is shifting. We've seen in the past when the plate starts shifting. Here, let me get this open for you. When this starts to shift on land, we see compensation earthquakes, big earthquakes, 7.5 to 7.7 .7 in the past, happen on the north side of the area that's shifting. I'll use Vancouver Island as an example. In 2012, all of Vancouver Island experienced thousands of these little red dots, thousands of these tremors across the whole area, and then the red dot stopped. And within a few days, a 7.7 .7 earthquake struck on the north side of the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone at the Heck 8 Strait, right next to where the buoy's in event mode now. So this time, while the plate's shifting, we get a 7.5 striking up to the northwest, but it's much further to the north. Again, it shifted in Vancouver Island, and then a 7.7 .7 earthquake struck here in 2012. Now it's shifted down here, and we get a 7.5 to 7.8, again, about the same size earthquake, striking back up behind it, but 1,800 miles away. I measured it last night. 1,800 miles from here down to the Heck 8 Strait, roughly. It could be 1,900 if you include in a few more bends in the plate there. No earthquakes. Only tremors happening. Where the energy is coming in? Come on. This is 24 hours worth of earthquakes, so we're missing some activity up here in the northwest. And I would expect, with this new 7, putting energy into the edge of the craton, we're going to see an excitement. We should, but the number of tremors yesterday is low. Let's go show you again. Here's 219 yesterday. You know, I wouldn't put it past them to just turn it off. Or, or to, like, if let's say there's like 900 of these, that they would come in and report 100 of them. Because the people in the Northwest are maintaining a very, very foolish position. They say that there's no relation between anything. And that none of the earthquakes are related to anything. And the plate isn't related to the earthquakes. And the shaking and the vibrating isn't related to other earthquakes. So let's just say a big influx comes in today or last night. I wouldn't put it past them in the Pacific Northwest to literally just give you fake info. Take all the red dots off the screen and say, nothing's happening now, see? And they've done that many times before, so they're that shady up there. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not joking. They are literally that shady, guys. They will not report earthquakes to maintain a position that they previously said. So if they say there's not going to be earthquakes, they will, if an earthquake hits, they'll delete the earthquake and not report it. They're like dishonest weathermen who come out and dump out the rain gauge because they said it wasn't going to rain. You think I'm exaggerating? I'm not. Okay, so let's go back to the quakes. No earthquakes reported out of Washington and Oregon. Hmm. Edge of the craton should stand to move with a significant amount of activity over the next few days. Are they going to be able to hide that? When, when we get significant earthquake striking on land over the next few days. So when we start seeing fours and fives come in and on the plate, are they going to hide it? Maybe they'll downgrade it. Maybe they'll take the fives down to 4.9s. You know, take, take the fours down to 3.9s. But let's go in and look at this line of earthquakes coming in along the coast because this shows us something's going on. For instance, we got a 3.9, but I think it's more like a 4. Uh, well, hold on. Hey, the USGS has it at 3.9 on all their public feeds. But when you click on the earthquake, it says it's a 4.0. That's a little tricky, shady way of reporting the earthquake, wouldn't you say? Let's go to the origin page. Go look at the magnitudes. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. It says 3.9. Which is it, guys? Let's go over to the magnitudes and go down the list and see how they came to their determination. No station details contributed to show us how they came to their determination. Hmm. Let's go down the station list and see what the stations are showing. Now, I will throw out the high end and I'll throw out the low end. So low end, we're throwing out the threes. And high end, we're going to throw out, well, let's see how high we go on the list. 4.3, 4.4. Anything bigger than 4.3, 4.4? 4 
Looks like 4.3 and 4.4 are the highest on the list. So, yeah, well, I got another couple 4.4s on there. Throw those out. And what does that leave us with? 4.1, 4.2. If we throw out the threes and throw out the upper fours, well, that leaves us again with 4.0 to 4.1. And why do I do that? How, many, how can there be that many wrong stations? Wouldn't it be more likely that somebody in a cubicle at the USGS would be wrong? as opposed to all those calibrated stations. You got 100 calibrated stations showing anywhere between 4 and 4.3. <laughs> and then you got a cubicle pencil pusher who takes it down to 3.9. What do we want to believe? It shouldn't be a matter of belief, but I just, when I see them do that, they can't have any 4s in Northern California right now. You know why? Because I issued a warning for up to 4.9 to strike right here at Napa Valley. And the earthquake, the 3.9, 4.0, struck just north of Napa Valley. And they're that concerned about earthquake forecasting because they really went out on a limb and said that there was no way to forecast earthquakes and that nobody had demonstrated a method. I tried to send them the method and you know what they did? They publicly responded to me and said they didn't want to test it. We've got, we've got them on social media. Professionals now at IRIS, I-R-I-S, the Earthquake Institute that feeds in, uh, information to the USGS. And they would not review the forecasting method. They said they did not want to test it. And I said, is that your final answer? This is public now on Twitter. That was the most foolish thing they could have ever done. To say they don't want to test a method that's been presented to them. <laughs> when they have it on their sites that no one's ever demonstrated a method and that it needs to be tested. <laughs> Yeah, that's why it's never been tested, because they won't test them. Because they previously said it couldn't be done. And now they take the earthquakes that strike and take them down by a little bit to make it under the expected magnitude that's been forecast. That's what's happening here. But anyway, a four coming into Geysers, California. Oh, wait, it's listed as Cobb. Well, hold on. Let's click on another earthquake, because depending on which earthquake you click on, one's going to be obscured. The other's going to tell you what's at the location. You see it says the geysers. But the other earthquake said Cobb. And they're both at the same location. Or off by a few feet. So why is the computer telling everybody that it's at Cobb when it's really at a geothermal pumping operation volcano called Geyserville? I would say they don't want people to know what's at the location. That's why it would give you different coordinates and different names, even though they're just a few feet apart. Now, going down in this diagonal line through the Bay Area, we get just south of the Bay Area, and you should be able to see the diagonal line carries on and dead ends down here at a place called San Lucas, California, or Parkfield. And we'll pull the coordinates and show you where it is in relation to the San Andreas. Look at this. It's right on the San Andreas, where the star is. The star and the red line, the thick red line, goes right back up to the north and meets in with the Juan de Fuca fracture zone, which I've shown so many times. And the volcano right along it, we already just talked about that, at Geyserville. So why are we stopping on the San Andreas? Why aren't we carrying on? This is the whole creeping section of the San Andreas right here. Monterey Bay, south of the Bay Area, all of this creeping. And it shifts and moves. There's even... Pictures of buildings that have been built along the creeping section and half the buildings being torn one way and half the buildings being torn the other. But there's a reason we stop here instead of carrying on down to the south. Let me show you. What would you do if I told you that humans have come in next to the San Andreas and perforated the hell out of it to the point where when energy is coming down the San Andreas, it jumps off the San Andreas like a train that's been derailed. This is the San Andreas. You can see it in the topography. And the earthquake epicenter right here. Now right next to the earthquake epicenter, we're going to go over just right across this little field or this little mountain range and into this field. And I always look within 6 to 10 miles and we're certainly close enough for that. And these are all old oil and gas frack wells. And I think this is fracking, I'm pretty sure. So we've got tanks, jacks, pumps, pipelines, and let me find one of the oil wells. So there's the pump for that. And we go across the field and we have more. And you can see the flare burn-off apparatus and you can see the jack or the pump there. Again, an oil well. So we stop. The earthquakes go down the San Andreas and they kind of stop right there where the drill points pick up. 
and they really pick up. The drill points pick up into the tens of thousands of drill points right along the San Andreas. Just randomly zoom in here, and you're going to find a whole bunch of oil. And this is the San Andreas right here. And it comes down real close. And actually, believe it or not, it comes even closer to the San Andreas the further south we go. This is San Andreas, and the drill points go right up to it. And look how many there are, guys. Somebody somewhere knew something where they drilled in and they knew it was going to create perforations along here. And that's why they did the whole mountain range this way. This is what the mountain range used to look like. Gullies, hilltops, etc. And then they came in and scraped off every hilltop across the whole mountain range. It looks like sand dunes now. And all of this is drilled. So this is drilled right up to the San Andreas. And what happens is the energy comes down the San Andreas when it gets to the, where the drill points start, jumps over to the drill points. So where are the earthquakes in the valley? Well, what would you do if I told you that the drill points carry on in a diagonal line down across the valley, down to the southeast tip of the valley? And that's where the earthquakes pick back up. So it's like a perforation that Mother Nature follows that humans made. We come down the San Andreas, jump over, go down to the east by southeast, and end up down here at the south tip of the valley next to the Garlock. And on this side, it's all been drilled again. All been drilled. And tens of thousands of times, it goes down and around the south tip of the valley through all of these. And it goes across over through the farmer's fields over to the west. And meets back up with those, it goes through the farmer's field and meets back up with that mountain range I just showed you. And all of this being drilled. All of this is drilled. All of this is drilled tens of thousands of times down across the valley, back around and up to the north, where it picks back up with another oil field here through the farmer's fields, through the crops, and it goes up here into what I call insane overdrive drilling, which all of this is one giant oil patch at Bakersfield, California. And look, it just goes on for miles. This is just one patch. And it goes up to the north and connects in all the way up to here to halfway house. I'm not against oil and gas at all. At all. We just have to understand that when you drill, it's going to release energy at the drill points where Mother Nature applies force or power into the plate. It's going to seek it out. It's going to go right down across the San Andreas and go to the drill points. And if there's no drill points there, it'll go to the volcanoes. Hence the volcanoes getting hit over on the eastern side of California at the California-Nevada border. Going up to the north, let's just go look at this lone earthquake. We got a lone two at a place called Almanor, California. We're just north of Almanor. But there's something at Almanor. Lake Almanor. But Lake Almanor is at something itself. It's at the base of a large volcano called Lassen Peak. Let me show it to you. There's Lake Almanor. Beautiful. Chester, California. But really, it's just at the foot of Mount Lassen. It's a stratovolcano. Mount Lassen erupted 100 years ago. Here's the volcanic field off of Lassen, going over to the east. Now, I would like to point out, we have a bunch of fireplace marks there. We don't have fires here right now, which is good news. So there have... Oh, wait. Hold on. I spoke too soon. Look at this. When were these from? Oh, sorry if I've got a cat meowing. September 10th. 10 days ago, or wait, a month ago. How is that even? Detection date, September 10th. Okay, we just have to keep that in mind when we look at these. We've got to check the dates on these. October 19, 2020. So this is yesterday. Partially contaminated fire pixel. I, again, temporarily filtered good fire pixel from September 10th. Well, I guess that's good news that they're older, but nothing new is good when it comes to hot spots. But we're right next to a volcano. There's no doubt about that. Paradise, California is the spot where the other hot spot was, and that's from a while ago as well. The volcanoes at the California-Nevada border, the number of earthquakes, believe it or not, is going down. And we want 
to actually see this the number of earthquakes slightly go up and for the energy to go across the plate I would prefer to see clusters of small earthquakes spread all the way across the plate over to the east coast following the craton edge that would indicate that energy is going across the plate and escaping out of the region but instead it seems to all be stuck here on the west coast and gone quiet in the pacific northwest that might be to them not reporting earthquakes but at the california nevada border this is a super volcano mammoth mountain is on the edge of a caldera of a super volcano mammoth mountain is its own volcano it's a ski resort too there's probably some people up there skiing right now if not now soon but here is the super volcano caldera and it's got a thousand cubic kilometers of melt down below this mammoth mountain is on the side of it right here and that's where our new little earthquake swarm is right down here inside of the caldera but hold on here's the epicenter for the little swarm and I think I see something right next to the earthquake swarm let's zoom in on these little buildings all of these are geothermal turbines they connect to pipelines the pipelines go out to drill points and the drill points go down a few hundred to a few thousand feet they go down to get steam out of the crust of the earth above the magma chamber and the drill points are like here for instance now you can follow this pipeline back through the woods and the pipeline will go to a geothermal station here's another spot where they've drilled a few hundred to a few thousand feet down into the super volcano to get steam to take back to the turbines now in their defense they did not know it was a super volcano when they drilled in a while back in the past few years they've done earth penetrating tomography measurements to figure out that there's a thousand cubic kilometers of melt down below now somebody else wrote me up below a YouTube video that I made in the past week uh, you know take it for what it's worth a grain of salt right when YouTube commenters start to disagree with you but somebody tried to tell me that they're doing bombing out here at Mina Mina Nevada and that's what the earthquakes are and that all these earthquakes are just explosions and that they don't mean anything and I said did you not know that a 6.5 earthquake struck out here and the USGS came out and studied it this isn't a bombing range not doing explosions out there and it's not only that it's down at like 10 kilometer depth is where the earthquakes are taking place a surface fissure fracture formed here across the ground up at the surface here let me show it to you hold on again since most people I guess aren't just paying attention or they just like to disagree that's what it is that's what it is people just like to argue on YouTube so here we are in June of 2020 and let's see if we've got pictures of it yeah here's the here's here's pictures of the actual crack in the ground the surface rupture mapped by the University of Nevada Reno field teams extends for about six miles west of Highway 95 only minor surface cracking was observed east of Highway 95 in the vicinity of the epicenter it went 12 total miles okay and this is old igneous rock or basalt lava rock and that's going again that's a, a picture of it so people just didn't know and they they when they hear me talking about an earthquake swarm at the Nevada border they immediately just want to disagree right it's it's the common human denominator of just wanting to sound smart you know try to correct somebody that you don't and it's it's kind of a problem but so the super volcano is getting hit with a little swarm of earthquakes and there is a swarm of earthquakes that's been going on since June since the 6.5 and surface fissure fracture happened across Monte Cristo Hills but look which way that fracture fracture points right into the back end of our arrow and look which way the earthquakes spread following the arrow trajectory going over into Utah and down into Texas and back up into Oklahoma following the Craton edge coming out of Monte Cristo so let's go over to the east and just take a look let's go down to the east by southeast look at the 2.1 the 0 0.9 the 1.6 let's go see where these locations are what's at each earthquake epicenter we need to find out Goldfield Goldfinger come on sing it with me Shirley Bassey got you guys got good voices I'm sure is the man the man dun, 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 dun. No, that's Goldfinger. Here we are at Gold Field. 
Now, there might be gold out here in the fields, but I would think that there's something else here nearby lending to the earthquake being developed here as opposed to anywhere else. See Lava Ridge, Lizard Hills, and Goblin Knobs? We are centered between all three. And Goblin Knobs are actually on the southern edge of the lunar craters, which all these are lava flows and spatter cones, cinder cones that go on for miles. Craters, some of the craters in the ground here are massive. Not a meteorite impact crater either, guys. That's a blast crater, a mar. And then across here, the older version, Goblin Knobs, the older version of lunar craters. And Lizard Hills, the older version of Goblin Knobs. So they just go in a line. And I can prove it to you. It really is. It's This is just an older version of that. Well, what do we got down here on the hilltops? What is going on here? Looks like mining. They're mining it. Gold. Remember what I told you? There's gold. Gold. What's this? Some kind of massive facility out here. With an airport. Is that an airport? Or is that a facility? That looks like a facility. No? Boy, we need, to, we need to find out what this place is. It's around the gallery. Got anything marked? Places? Oh, wait. We got something here. Test range. Secret airport. Heart? What the heck is going on here? What is it? Tonopa Test Range Airport. Oh, wow. Look. They've got a laser. Oh, my God. Oh, if you click on the picture, look what they have. Oh, shit. <laughs> ah, it's a directed energy weapon. Oh, my God. It's the laws. It's the laws. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. L-A-W-S laser. Oh, wait do you see this. Pew. Pew, pew, pew. Pew. There it is. Pew. It's been installed on all the ships already. This thing works, man. You got the test range. It'll shoot down incoming cruise missiles. It'll shoot down incoming drones. It'll blow up incoming boats. I already used this thing. It's already, this is a real life picture of it mounted on this, on the surface deck of whatever destroyer this is on ships this is 2014 wow dang all right well uh, you know what my life is so weird my life is so weird it's just so weird every day some weird thing is happening it's like i run my own public secret society it's not secret though it's the Society of Synchro Mystics. You just have to be legit and cool. That's all. You just have to be a cool person. You can't be uncool to be part of the Synchro Mystical Society. Okay, where are we going? We're going down here to the... I'm the grand pooba of that, by the way. Oh, wait. We're right here next to Doomtown. This is the famous Doomtown location. Operation Rise Line where they blew away the surface nuke test town there, and then we have all of our underground nuke testing going on here. Now, uh, this is over the past 40 years or 50 years that they did the nuke testing here. Every one of these is a different operation. For instance, October 19th. Whoa! Whoa! Just randomly clicked on this one. Bandicoot. This is, like, too weird. Okay. October 19th, 1962. 12.5 kilotons. That's freaky to click on that one. Because, I mean, today's October 20th. U.S. Nuke Operation Torch. February 21st, 1968. Unknown or undisclosed kiloton detonation. U.S. Nuke Operation Augur. Just one kiloton. And I say just one because they go up into the thousands of kilotons, which are megatons. So a line of earthquakes. Pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> going from Monte Cristo Hills down to the east-southeast, and we're on a voyage of discovery as we find these things. Let's go over to the 1.6 in southwest Utah. 5.5 kilometer depth. Kilometer. Paste and search. Dang. And I'll tell you what, finding secret military bases and laws, laser-directed energy weapon test sites. Yeah, we're just going to move on. Tokerville. Tokerville Butte and Kolob Peak. 
Kolob Peak. Now, Kolob Peak is covered in black basalt. Kind of speaks for itself what ruptured there a long time ago. Going down to the south, Tokerville Butte doesn't really look like very much, does it? Isn't Tokerville the explorer? Pine Valley and Sullivan Knoll Volcanic Butte. Sullivan Knoll has the same thing. Oh, look, they are mining on the side of there, getting the black. Look at that. Black and red cinders on the side. Crater Hill Butte is probably the most volcano-shaped of the bunch. Still visible. It's, again, so old. To call it a volcano now is not really doing it justice. And then the Smithsonian has it marked as the Santa Clara Volcanic Field and Cone. Pleistocene to Quaternary Volcanic Field north of St. George in southwest Utah. But that's where the earthquake is. So let's recap. Super Volcano hit. California Nevada border. Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Center hit. Line of earthquakes going over to our arrow. Where then we spread to the Laws Laser Nuclear Test Sites. DEW and nuclear test sites side by side. And then over to the east. Over to Utah. Right down here next to Santa Clara Volcanic Peak. Volcano to volcano and in between man-made fracture points. Up to the north, Yellowstone's magma chamber over to Yellowstone Park itself. Then into the edge of the arrow, 2.9, going down the edge of the craton. Going down to the drill points in Texas, which I shouldn't need to show you. Texas and Oklahoma, we know about the tens of thousands of drill points in West Texas. Actually, there's millions all the way across Texas, millions of drill points following that craton. West Coast. Okay, let's carry on. Ridgecrest, California. Now we have another line of earthquakes, and the number of earthquakes is now increasing. Does that sound familiar to anyone? We told you to watch for this. The number of earthquakes to go up, and the magnitudes behind it. And it was at zeros. You had just a handful of zeros. Now you've got zeros, ones, and twos, and the number of each is relatively larger than where we were. And look where we're swarming out. On the east side of Volcano Peak and all its lava flows. And let me tell you about what happened here last year. Last July, so just over a year ago, a 7.0 earthquake struck here. I issued the warning for that two days before it hit. Two days before the 7.0, it was the largest earthquake in 20 years in the whole state of California. Two days before it hit, I issued a warning for a 7.0 earthquake to strike from Bay Area to Central South California, right through in here. And what happened? Instead of hitting right through in here, it hit right here, next to it. I consider that an earthquake forecast hit, by the way. I was 200-something miles off. And for the largest earthquake in 20 years in California. And two days later, when it hit, it hit right in here, China Lake. And when it struck, a surface fissure formed that was like 20 miles long. And it formed starting right here along this road at this black splotch right here. Which is an old mound of old volcanic debris or igneous rock or basalt, a small fissure. And the crack went right through this thing, which I think is an old phased array radar. And then goes across the crack, went across all the way and kept going and going and going up to the north by northwest on the east side of all this, all these volcanoes. And then the earthquake swarm spread up to this. The geothermal pumping operation. Devil's Kitchen, where humans have drilled into this volcanic field to get steam. And that's where all the earthquakes are right now. There's one just north. But the rest start at the volcanoes and go down to Ridgecrest, which is on the Garlock. Let me show you the Garlock so you can understand where we dead in and to. Here. This is the Garlock. Energy is coming down, and it dead ends into here, but it doesn't stop there. Dead ends and then tries to go through, and it goes across the Mojave Desert, which then ends down to the south at the San Andres. And look, the earthquakes follow that path. They come down to the Garlock, spread across the Mojave. A couple of these are explosions, but this one over to the east, I don't know if this is an explosion. Let's go check it out. Nope, not an explosion. But look where it is. Hey, class. Wake up, everybody. ASMR Dutch here can get your attention. Let's talk about this. Let's go back to 2011. Hey, everybody. Get your attention? Okay, let's go back to 2011. 
when I first started my YouTube channel. I, my YouTube channel was around for maybe seven months. I started in December of 2010 making videos, okay? And by July of 2011, there was a radar event that happened out here. On radar, moisture was detected coming off the ground in the desert in the middle of the summer on a clear day with not a cloud in the sky. But yet on radar, we see moisture plume coming out of the ground. And it was so big, the moisture plume was a few miles wide. And it was so big that the moisture in the middle of the summer, in the desert, not like a storm, you couldn't see this, this was invisible to the human eye. This moisture blew with the Santa Ana winds and by the time it got over to North LA, was starting to dissipate, spread out and become just like a mist or a haze. Now I made a video on it showing the radar and put it out on YouTube. I only had a few thousand subscribers. That day, as soon as I put the video out, the USGS California Volcano Observatory came out and issued a statement about my video. And they said, a, a video circulating online claiming there's an eruption happening. And I didn't say there was, the volcano was erupting. I said, there's steam. It's some kind of steam coming out. And they denied it. This is on, on uh, within a few hours of me putting my video up. They denied it and said it must be a thunderstorm. Must be a thunderstorm in a press release. So they, they issued a full press release about my little video and said it was a thunderstorm. There's a problem with that. It went on for three days straight. <laughs> they should have waited. They jumped the gun. By day two and a half, they deleted the press release about me. Because they said it was a thunderstorm and we were all watching on radar and if it was a thunderstorm, it's not going to come from the same point on the ground. And it certainly isn't going to be going for three days straight from the same point on the ground. But by day three, my viewers started to drive out here on the highways to go investigate and see if they could see any steam. And by day three, it had kind of died out and gone away. I don't think it looked like a geyser coming out of the ground either. I think it would be looking really hazy in the area as all this moisture is just being boiled out of the ground over a vast area, not just like a guy, not Old Faithful style, not like that. We're talking just haze coming up as the groundwater is being evaporated from heat down below from this volcano that's there, which is clearly a volcano and lava flow. So my viewers drove out on day three, and guess what they found out there? No steam. They found trucks driving around from Raytheon with VLF antennas on them. And they got pictures of it and uploaded the videos to YouTube, which are still on YouTube for 2011. So, first there was a steam burst, got caught on radar, I made a video, USGS responded, said it wasn't anything, and that was on day one. By day three, they delete their press release because it kept going on for three days. My viewers drove out, found Raytheon trucks driving around with VLF antennas, which are going to be used to measure magma chambers down inside of the ground, for instance. To top it all off, a couple weeks after, a 5.0 earthquake struck right next to it. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Within a few weeks. Then, by September, YouTube deleted my channel for the first time, and I lost all my videos. Oh, and in that time, I got contacted by the U.S. Marines. 29 Palms military base down here telling me to take down my video or asking me to take down my video because they were worried that people, my viewers, were going to try and enter the volcanic location through the base roads, which apparently goes through part of the base, or that people from the base, they, I don't know what the guy was trying to say, the communications commander from the base left a message below my video telling me to contact them at the base. So I called the base, which put me to a switchboard. The switchboard put me to his secretary. Secretary put me through to him and he asked me to take down the video. And I said to him, and this is crazy that this even happened. And I said to him, I go, if I take the video down, that's going to create more suspicion. I should just put a disclaimer up on the video saying, don't try to enter from any other way except from the highway, if at all. And I encourage my viewers just to not even go out there because it's desert location and you don't need to be out there in the middle of July in Death Valley looking for steam when we can just look on radar. So I put the disclaimer on the video. That was July. And by September, my YouTube channel was fully terminated. And I lost all my videos for the first year. I had to fight to get my channel back. Anyway, now we got a 3.1 earthquake out there. At the volcano right next to it. Same time, we've got activity at the volcano up here. And we act have activity at these volcanoes up here. And we have activity at the volcano up in Northern California. And we have activity next to Lake Almanor. As the plate is shifting across Oregon and Washington, where they aren't reporting anything. 
Cue up the Twilight Zone music, please, because that's freaky deaky. Now, finally, let's get down here into Southern California, where we have another diagonal line of quakes. And this is where we always end up. We end up in Southern California after everything else. The energy finally makes its way to the edge of the North American plate in the south and tries to go across over to the east. And today, or last night, is the expiration of the warning for our four different earthquakes we're looking for across California. Let me rename them again. We're looking for activity up here at Eureka and down here to Napa Valley Bay Area. We're looking for activity at Owens Valley or at Monte Cristo Hills down to Owens Valley. And then finally, the fifth earthquake, if all the other fours were to hit, were to be taking place down here, down next to San Diego and East Southeast LA. So what's happened? A bunch of threes, not fours. I'm looking for upper fours to fives and a bunch of mid to upper threes come in up to 3.9, a magnitude under. So if that was mid-range fours to 4.9s, that would be an earthquake forecast hit at three of the four locations that I warned. And the fifth, not happening yet, and none of it's happened yet, really, because the plate is still shifting. We get back up here to the tremor map, the slow slip, and you can see, as of yesterday, the plate is still shifting with hundreds of tremors. But it's dying out, at least as of yesterday. Is it going to go back up? I personally think they'll kill it. I think they will kill the feed as opposed to let us see that there is an increase that takes place after an earthquake up in the northwest, in Alaska, the 7.5 in Swarm that they won't allow this to go up because they previously said it wouldn't. And so if it does, they're going to delete it. And, I don't know, a tree in the woods, nobody there to hear it kind of thing. But getting back to where I started this whole update, the massive earthquake up in Alaska indicates that there's energy coming in across the plate. Boundaries now on the plate boundaries. Let me show it to you one more time. Plate boundary to the northwest. Energy is coming in from up here. It's going to be going down into the Juan de Fuca. The only question is, is it going to excite things or is it going to make it die? Looks like Anchorage, Alaska is also starting to move. By the way, this past week, the Air Force Base up here got hit. You know, I, it's just something else we got to talk about. The Air Force Base is getting hit. What are the chances that our directed energy weapon location would get hit? Directed energy weapon test site getting hit with an earthquake. Come on, man. Please. I, again, I don't mean to make too big of a deal about it, but I just got to point that out, that that's just the freakiest thing in the world. Now, we know that directed energy weapons can lead to seismic release. If you don't know how that can happen, I would suggest that you watch Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden's Soviet Weather Engineering Over North America lecture from 1985 explaining how piezo piezoelectric, sorry, piezoelectric energy can be translated from radio waves and directed energy weapons in space and in the atmosphere and how that can go to ground. How the Earth's magnetic field captures that energy and takes it to ground. And when the Earth's crust gets charged with the overpower of electric, guess what happens? An earthquake takes place. Like an overcharged capacitor that explodes. It's amazing. So if you want to see that, you can go download a copy. You can buy a copy. I recommend you buy a copy from him while he's still alive, guys. Go get it from Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden yourself. He will mail it to you. It's amazing. So you guys need to have an earthquake plan. You need to watch what's going on. The 7.5 to 7.8 earthquake up here causing buoy displacement as far south as this whatever off the coast of Hawaii and causing movement as far east as off the coast of Haida Gwaii, right in the middle of our warned closed area that has not been hit at all. And then the buoy goes into event mode there. And let me show it to you again. Hold on. NDBC buoys. This is just so amazing. The buoys are still in event mode because they go in event mode for 24 hours after any sensing of an event. But look where it is. The buoy in event mode on the western side of Haida Gwaii, right next to our warned spot. So the whole area right up to the doorstep of our warned location just moved last night. Is it done yet? I don't think so. I think it's going to play in, but are they going to be honest? Who knows? They're not. Not normally. 
Ah, yes. Okay, so going back to the West Pacific, where this all originates. All the energy originates down below the plates, hence the deep earthquakes raised high off the globe. That's why we pay attention to the deep earthquakes. These are like the jackhammers for the energy to come up from the underside of the plate. Now check this out. This is what I think is happening down below the plate. I think that in the magma, waves, concentric waves, the curvature of the earth, the under, or the curvature of the underside of the plate, regardless of whether or not the earthers, I got flat earthers who are viewers too, you know, but seriously, that the underside of the plate's curved. And where the waves come in on the underside of the curved plate, that's where they focus in. And at these curvatures on the underside of the plate, that's where the focus takes place and the whole combined force of all the waves coming in combine into what's called a singularity or a spike, which then hammers in on the underside of the plate. Then the wave spreads out and that hammering action ha happening over and over again, I think creates a standing wave like what we're seeing in this tank here in the fluid and see how the waves are equal distantly equidistantly spaced and how in between them we have valleys, of course, the peak in the valley of the wave, but each peak fills the previous center of the valley as it moves uniformly through the tank in a standing wave. So instead of being in a tank, though, I think we're on the plate boundary. The red lines over here in the West Pacific and going all the way around up into Alaska and all the way over to Europe, that this is the wave tank. And it contains the wave as it spreads out through the tank. And it drops off same-sized earthquakes all the way along the way. That's why we're getting 5.3 to 5.5 everywhere, all the way out to Europe and all the way out to the Iceland pinnacle tip in one way. And we're getting 5.3 to 5.5 the other way as the wave spreads out. But these are the hammer points where the deep earthquakes are coming in. And we're not let down. Next to each hammer point, we have a shallower, larger earthquake. So we have a deep 4.5 next to it, a shallow 5.3. We have deep fours next to it, shallow fives. Same here. But this, we have deep fives. That should mean shallow sixes or greater. Coming up next to the deep five locations. Hasn't happened yet. This deep five just happened yesterday. So we watch for up to seven days for there to be an effect to come up through the plate. This means Indonesia is about to get hit. And we look at Indonesia where the rings overlap, where all the rings overlap between our two sets of areas. Bali, Indonesia right here next to East Timor. Japan has gone quiet. That's another thing I've talked about already. Japan gone quiet in the last 24 hours. South Japan, I have not checked the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center either. We should go look at that. Going down the list, Sabankaya, Riventador, Sanjay. These are all in South America. Dukono in Indonesia. Who else? Suwanese in South Japan. Suwanese Ajima. Looking for anybody else on the list. Yesterday, we had a new addition, Pakaya, in Guatemala from yesterday, which also needs to be talked about, really, but that's on the opposite side of the plate. So let's just talk about this right here in the middle. Suwanese Ajima is erupting in the middle of this open silent zone. Down to the south, where all these rings overlap, right here, where this letter V is. Let me show it to you. There, where the letter V is, Dukono Volcano is erupting. Mount Semeru and Mount Carinci over to the west were erupting last week. Well, Carinci is right here where the rings overlap. And Semeru is right here in eastern Java where the rings overlap, basically. Going across the plate this way, though, we get into Guatemala and Pacaya Volcano has suddenly erupted. Pacaya is never on the list. So Pacaya on the list on top of Fuego. We had our warning going right here at El Salvador. And we get a new volcanic blast at Pacaya. I'll say that's likely a sign that we're going to see the release. Upper 5 to low 6 off the coast of El Salvador. But either way, we get a new eruption there. I'm going to check it off the list either way. Going across the Caribbean, we got an outbreak taking place at the eastern side of Dominican Republic and a new swarm taking place, or a carry-on of the swarm, at Puerto Rico. And like I said at the start of the broadcast, 4.9. That's a 5, whatever. It's the same size, likely, as what it up here at Iceland. So it's probably like a 5.5. Come on, do you think it's a 4.9 here between the X's? And a 4.9 here? And a 4.9 back over here from two days ago? Let me get that on there. Please. And going back up to the west-northwest. It's too many 4.9s. Something's up. With the reporting of the earthquakes now. 
something a little shady. Let me put it this way. If I was doing it, what would everybody say? If I was taking 5.0, a bunch of fives, and taking them all down to 4.9, because I said there was going to be less fives or something. Imagine this. I come out and be like, guys, there's going to be less. There's not going to be an increase this year. There's never an increase. It's just always okay. It's always there's status quo. And then an increase of five starts to take place. And you're watching it along with me. And then I come in and start changing them to 4.9s. And I'm like, there's no increase in fives. What are you talking about? There's no increase in fives. And I do that. And I do that for a full year every day on, on, on a bunch of fives. And then at the end of the year, I come back and I'm like, hey, I was right. There wasn't an increase in fives this year. What would you guys say? That's what they're doing, guys. I'm not exaggerating. So somebody's got to say something. <laughs> if they don't, uh, people in the future will not realize they're being faked out. That somebody's padding the numbers to make it look like there's less. So the people in the future need to realize that the people nowadays are trying to hide any increase that's taking place. So there never will be an increase. So they'll always be right. It's amazing. Okay, anyway, do you guys have an earthquake plan? Do you know what to do when an earthquake strikes? You're supposed to take shelter underneath a table or a desk. Professionals put out faulty information for like 100 years about going underneath door frames. Do you know that? everywhere. Go underneath a door frame. Well, now professionals say that they were incorrect in telling everybody to go underneath door frames. And they even say that they never told people to go under door frames. They've changed, they've 1984 history on this. They try to say that they never told people to go under door frames. And then that was just a wives tale. Go, go look it up. They say, don't go under door frames. We never told you to go under door frames because it's all just based on an old picture from the late 1800s, early 1900s that caught on around the world. And that that's why everybody thinks they need to go under a door frame. Because you all just misunderstood because you were looking at a picture that showed a picture of a door frame from the 1800s. And that's why you all think you're supposed to go under door frames. Because they never told you to do it. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Go look it up. So, they never told you to go underneath door frames. Okay. Well, now they're telling you to go underneath tables or desks. I'll give you a piece of advice. Don't go underneath a glass table or desk. And you know what? You should probably also have an exit plan out of the structure that you're in, whether you're at work or whether you're at home or whether you're at somebody's house. You need to always know what those exits are. So that way you can quickly make your way to the exit if you need to get out of the house or structure if you're not confident in it withstanding a large earthquake. Moderate earthquakes are just going to knock things off shelves, aren't going to cause a structure to collapse. But once you get up above that mid-range to upper four level, it is enough to cause collapse and breakage on brick buildings and stone and cinder block buildings. Once you get up above that mid-range five level, up into the six, certainly can cause collapses in stone structures. So you need to pay attention to what kind of structure you're in. You know, sky rise, high rise, skyscrapers, those usually withstand very large earthquakes. Look at Japan in 2011, even very close to the earthquake epicenter. A lot of those buildings stood, even the frame houses, stayed standing. Yes, there was major destruction inside of the houses. Drywall fell, cabinets fall off the walls, just everything. But the houses stood, except for the stone houses, of course. That's good news in a 9.0 earthquake to see that frame houses still stood with today's building codes over in Japan because a lot of the building codes in the United States are going to reflect that. But stone houses are entirely different. You need to have an exit plan. If you don't know where you're going to go outside, you pre-designate an area outside. Then you make sure that your friends and family and co-workers, that you all know where you're supposed to go outside, just like a fire drill. If you're going outside, you might not come back in for a long time, maybe hours, maybe days. Or you might be getting lucky and come back in, but grab your emergency kit if you're going outside. It'll have a change of clothes, set of shoes, food and water for a couple days, sanitation, first aid, form of communication, your extra IDs, extra keys. You don't want to be fumbling for your wallet in your purse and a ring of keys when a major earthquake is happening. Good luck even finding it if it's at night. If it's at night and you don't have power, how are you going to find it? You're going to be running around with your cell phone or your mobile phone with a little flashlight on it. That's another thing you need to have. Batteries and a flashlight into the kit so you don't get stuck using your mobile phone for 
a flashlight. You can solve that problem with a battery and a flashlight. They're so cheap now. Dollar store guys. Dollar store can get a lot of these things. You know, it kind of doesn't matter where you get the things that you're going to use to survive and dispose of anyways after a few days. 10.57 a.m. Central Time right now. Let me just bring you all up to speed really quick. If you don't know what happened yesterday, last night, an extremely large earthquake struck on the coast of Alaska, creating localized tsunami waves. And we have energy that's coming into the northwest portion of the Pacific Plate, or the North American Plate, out of the Pacific, which means we're going to see an increase go down into California. Today is the last day of the warning, or last night it expired. I will extend it for 24 hours. I don't extend warnings very often. If I get it wrong, I get it wrong. So we'll give it 24 hours since this big earthquake just hit and we're right on the last day of the warning. But if I don't see anything by tomorrow in California, I'm canceling the warning. Even though threes hit all the way across California in the exact spots where we talked about. Eureka, over at the California-Nevada border and down at south, down next to San Diego. I'm still waiting for that full release. And if I don't see it, I cancel the warning and reassess how I got it wrong. If I get it wrong, I come back and really beat myself on, on it. Now, hey, name me a forecaster in weather or elsewhere who does that when they get it wrong. So, hey, hurricane forecast. They told you it was going to come in somewhere, and then 12 hours before, they switch it. They switch it by a few hundred miles. Next thing you know, it's coming in in western Louisiana when it's supposed to come in the east. Do they come back and apologize? You know, do you question their hurricane models and all that stuff, and do they throw out the hurricane models when they don't get it right down to a 200-mile area? No. They never do. They never come back and apologize. I'm the only one who does. And I will try to get into it publicly as to why I think I got it wrong. It's amazing. Hey, got a big old rumble of something outside. Big old rumble of something just happened outside. Do we got thunder on the radar? We got lightning on the radar? That's amazing. We got a thunderstorm kicking up here. Okay, well, let's enjoy the view. Let me get the view on the screen here. Let's go watch the storm. And if anything else happens, I'll jump back on at a moment's notice. I'm going to upload this over on YouTube, and we're going to watch it back at a later date. We'll watch it back today even. You guys can share it. I would really appreciate you getting it out to the world. Peace out, guys. Much love.